And just like the movies, we play out our last scene. I'm the Game Anthropologist, and welcome to a painful episode of this show. Why painful? Well, a discussion of culture I have in store for you today is so full of cinematic detritus that your eyeballs might hemorrhage. That's right. Today we'll be taking a look at video game movies. A seeming pile of crap by any other name is still crap. No matter how we sugarcoat it, the movie industry has been none too kind to video games. We as gamers, and also in solidarity with movie viewers, have been forced to suffer through countless horrible adaptations of video games to the silver screen. Not to mention movies where video games are a background focus to the point where it becomes extraneous. A baptism by fire would be a welcome upgrade to what pop culture has been subjected to with these movies. But why is that? Shouldn't the gaming industry along with the movie industry be the two tastes that go great together? Oh, you have your quality character development and fantasy setting in my rich cinematic tradition and enormous budget, and vice versa. Every medium of pop culture that we can conceive of has made a relatively successful transition to the silver screen. It's almost a validation of that medium once it makes its high ascendancy from thought to page to projector. To discover why video games have had such a bum rap in the movies, it's best to take a movie cliche of flashbacks and discuss the past failures of video game movies, analyze the possible ways to improve on the concept, and scrutinize the present situation. We gotta ask the tough questions that we as gamers and movie viewers all must ask. We'll try to find out if there's still hope for the future of video game movies as we try to find... Who Killed the Video Game Movie? Now, I might be on the path of harsh hyperbole with the title of the show, but it does seem like there's something nefarious going on with the relationship video games have with the movie industry. Almost to the point that it seems like there's someone, or something, out there purposely setting up these movies for failure. Let's cut to the start of it all and see if we can get to the bottom of this. Now, in lieu of boring you to death with details, let me establish that there are certain varieties of video game movies. This is not to say that this is the proper colloquialism for these films. It's just what I've observed in my analysis, and also a possible way for us to understand the problem with these movies. It also gives us a timeline as to when the genre video game movie first came into being. The earliest variety being what I call the immersive video game movie. This is the earliest breed, and oftentimes most movie viewers and even gamers don't bring these films into consideration. But how could you not? 
The release coincided with the time that video games really took off in North America. Plus, they represented the connection that the gamer has with the game. Movies like Tron, where the character himself is an avid gamer, arcade games due to the console market being in its infancy, and is literally pulled into the universe of the game. This might be the most successful of this early class of video game movies, and it's definitely on my top 10 list of all time movies. But most importantly, it accomplished the first key step into creating the genre of video game movies. Tron itself was followed up by other immersive video game movies like the cult favorite among moviegoers and gamers alike, The Bishop of Battle from the horror anthology movie Nightmares. I won't spoil too much for you, but it basically consists of Emilio Estevez being an uber badass and has a terrifying, by 1980s standards, ending. After this comes what might be the best of this whole category, The Last Starfighter. God, I love this movie. It's every gamer's dream to be playing a game that you absolutely love and are absolutely dominant at and then be whisked away by a recruiter to battle the very enemies you were facing in the game. Although it could also be equally as terrifying as the main character observes in the movie. This movie was the cherry on top of the sundae of immersive video game movies that began with Tron. Plus it gave you the ultimate excuse to any parental figure as to the reason why you play games 40 hours a week. Needless to say, with these three films alone I would call this variety of video game movie the most successful. It introduced the audience of gamers and all walks of life to the potential that video games have in cinema, and in art in general. That being said, the honeymoon for the immersive video game movie didn't last very long. It appears as the 80s moved along, filmmakers attempted to duplicate the success of Tron, top-notch special effects, and a little transportation to a video game, with very, very limited success. As the 90s began, the immersive video game movie seemed all but dead. The well-thought-out plots and special effects of the past were being attempted by the lowest end of the budget spectrum. It also seems like filmmakers of the early 1990s were conflating the idea of virtual reality and video games. Thus, the quality of the immersive video game movie deteriorated. It wouldn't become a viable option again until it got a temporary shot in the arm with a movie called Existence. Not only was this movie centered around an immersive video game universe, but it was also filled with Inception-style puzzles, plot twists, and a creepy mechanical and organic atmosphere that only a director like David Cronenberg could create. It was sort of like Videodrome, but the focus clearly on gaming and less sex and unbelievable swearing. Death to the demoness. There was also a Japanese release movie entitled Avalon, which unfortunately I haven't had the pleasure of seeing yet. It involves characters immersed in a world of an MMO, and I've been told it's a clear winner amongst gamers and movie critics alike. Unfortunately, the same can't be said of other immersive titles released in the noughties. Again, we see a shift into low budget stand here and thus lose all semblance of a good film, the exception being the movie Gamer. Big budget, big stars, big action, but total shit. But why? Probably because they envisioned video games to be the violent murder simulators that Jack Thompson would have society believe. And they still seem to be confusing the idea of virtual reality and video games again. Compare that to a movie that came out a few years earlier, Stay Alive. A movie that had so much going for it. It had a pretty fair and effective look into the gamer world. And it seemed with the product placement that they had the weight of the video game industry behind them as well. So what held this immersive movie back? Well, crappy special effects, a story that seemed played out and lacking creativity, and a cast of notable blocks of wood whose sole build star was Malcolm himself, Frankie Muniz. Alright, hold on there for just a second. I probably should have stipulated at the very beginning of this show that this episode is not going to have a lot of good hard science to it. I mean, there's not really a whole lot of good hard science in determining what is good or what is bad. It's really basically subjective opinion. And I do realize that the movie Stay Alive is an enormous fan base amongst video gamers. But to make it up to you for all the bad things I just said about it, I'm going to show you one of the funniest lines I have ever seen in a video game movie. And I really, really hope it becomes a gamer meme. You skip this bullshit cinematic foreplay. I want to butter this muffin. God, I love that. And I think with that brief description, you can understand where I'm coming from in saying that this movie sucks. And we'll move on to the next class of video game movies. The video game adaptation. Ah, the video game adaptation, by far the most out there of all video game movies. Well, actually, to anyone with a functioning brainstem, it defines what a video game movie is. A direct adaptation of our favorite pixelated heroes and villains into a finely crafted work of cinema. And it's without a doubt the absolute worst of these varieties of video game movies. Internet reviewing careers have been defined by how hard they can riff on a video game adaptation. I think that this class of gaming movies is best defined by the following. A series of great anticipation. Complete and soul-crushing defeat, followed by a giant step forward, back to great anticipation, and then complete and soul-crushing defeat. Basically a continuous loop around those lines. Let me give you a quick and easy example to follow. Super Mario Bros. The Movie. I can remember my 11-year-old brain going completely apeshit with anticipation for this movie. Although the trailers made the Mushroom Kingdom look totally antithetical to what I and all gamers on planet Earth thought it should be, I was excited nonetheless. 
then I saw it. Enter complete, soul-crushing defeat. After seeing the debasing of one of the all-time greatest video games on the silver screen, I held out zero hope for a successful adaptation. And that notion was validated as I wallowed through the likes of Double Dragon and Street Fighter. Until I saw a shining beacon through the piss-soaked basin of mediocrity. Oh hell yes! The game that fulfilled my fetish for freezing bitches and looking at muscular forearm freaks would be coming to a theater near me. And it didn't completely disappoint. Sure, the acting was subpar, the fight scenes involving multiple characters was poo-poo, and the primitive CGI was, well, primitive. But for what it did right, the solo fight scenes, the atmosphere, actually portraying an effective look for all the characters featured, and yes, I include Muppet Goro in that description, it was a major step forward for video game movie adaptations. My hope was renewed and I was thus in full anticipation mode for the sequel that was baited for me at the end of the first film, only to discover that Mortal Kombat Annihilation would lead me down the road to soul-crushing defeat yet again. I could go on, but you get the picture on how the rest of the story turns out. Giant step forward, anticipation, soul crushed, giant step forward, anticipation, soul crushed, and so on, and so on, and so on. So let's get right to it. What makes these video game adaptations so bad? Who can we suspect is the likely culprit behind killing the video game adaptation and the immersive video game movie? Luckily for us, the suspect list is relatively short. Let's start with a big one. Hollywood. <laughs> okay. Always at the top, they tend to be the most obvious suspect given how destructive they've been to intellectual property over the years. I mean, with the previously stated Mortal Kombat Annihilation, they made the movie nearly unwatchable by accentuating the weaknesses of the first film. Action scenes involving too many damn characters on screen at once. Acting that would make Ed Wood blush in an absolutely crap-tastic array of CGI. But their destructive tendencies go deeper than just making something worse. One can blame the producer, the director, the writers, hell, even the gaffers if you fancy yourself as some kind of angry reactionary. From there, it takes on the form of actors and directors who've never played video games, producers who don't take games seriously in any way, shape, or form, and writers who don't feel that games are really a form of storytelling. It's almost a contempt by Hollywood towards gaming. They feel that they can tell a more effective story than a bunch of programmers and quote-unquote hack video game writers. Thus, they mold the story to fit their interpretation. Where William F. Guile is now a cardboard action star with a dodgy accent, the demons of the UAC facility on Mars that constantly torment the lone, nameless marine are now a scientific experiment gone awry, and Max Payne is not the noir-inspired, wisecracking cop of the score to settle, but Marky Mark giving a performance so insipid I wouldn't have been surprised if he didn't turn to Jack Lapino and spat out, Say hi to your mother for me. Okay, I'll show the clip. Okay, well it was great to meet you. Say hi to your mother for me, okay? <laughs> I am Max Payne, say hi to your mother for me. <laughs> Which brings me to the most prime of prime suspects. Maybe not prime in so much he's a person of interest in the crimes against video game movies. You know where I'm going with this. You can't mention video game movies without bringing them up. Say it with me now. Uva Bowl. This Teutonic twit is responsible for a theme park's worth of horrible game to movie adaptations. The more the gaming and movie critics malign him, the more he keeps pushing. I guess that's something to admire. I guess. He's not so much a suspect responsible for killing the video game movie, but more of a miscreant for holding it hostage. He has bought up a multitude of video game movie rights to the chagrin of the gaming community. Mainly because, well, let's let him tell you. We have uns ja auch äh, spezialisiert auf Videospielverfilmungen, weil so Videospiele, die kennt man weltweit, die gibt's dann schon als Videospiel in den einzelnen Ländern und dann ist natürlich auch einfacher der Film zu verkaufen. Also, das ist eine reine Marketingmaßnahme gewesen. Ich selber spiele überhaupt keine Videospiele. Did you catch that? He does not play video games and seems to have an open disdain for them. The video game movie has been frozen in its current state of mediocrity based solely on the works and motivations of Uwe Boll. It's a wonder how video game companies still allow him to create an adaptation of their baby when he often veers so far away from a good movie. With each new Boll release, there seems to be an extra level of shittiness along with it. And it goes without saying, but he's produced some of the worst video game movies of all time. The problem is, which one's the worst? I guess I could be an edgy reviewer and include all of them in a bid to be unique. That doesn't do the moniker of being the biggest steaming pile of video game celluloid justice. How about a thorough examination of each bowl video game movie? A slow, point-by-point -point presentation of each horrendous film that... God, no, no, it's Alone in the Dark! Alone in the Dark by a country mile! I have never come upon a movie that I couldn't say one positive thing about until I saw Alone in the Dark. Leave it to Uwe Boll to make an adaptation of Alone in the Dark that carried on from the woefully drab sequels to the series and not the original. 
Gone is the love crappy and creepiness, only to be replaced by some kind of pseudo-military, Ghostbuster, Indiana Jones, mishmash of other elements from good movies into a casserole of cheesy acting, bad special effects, and all-around suckage. Christian Slater, who I think is an alright actor, is just totally bland. Deacon Frost here is just a waste of a character, so there's really no need to ever mention him again. And Terry pulls off the grandest prize by being an even more unconvincing scientist slash love interest than Christmas Jones from The World Is Not Enough. So many reviewers from the internet to the screaming troll in a bathroom stall comment on the badness of this movie. It does no good for me or you to continue to pile on. The best advice I can give you is to go see the movie. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Alone in the Dark is so bad that you just have to see it. You have to witness the utter hopelessness that arises from watching this morally bankrupt film. And then you just may realize why Uwe Boll tops this list of suspects and needs to be stopped. And I'm not joking about this. Just ask the fans for the potential World of Warcraft and Metal Gear Solid moves. How best to combat the nefarious German Ed Wood? Sorry about that, guys. It's hard as a gamer to be objective when talking about Mr. Bull. It's time to press on and dig a little deeper into the problem with video game movies. Let's flip this around and take a quote from the bolster himself on one of the reasons he feels his movies, if not all video game movies, fare so poorly. Fans are always totally flipping out, and I understand that the fan of a video game has his own agenda in his head, and has his ideas about what is a good movie and what is a bad movie. I really hate to have to listen to a guy who calls his critics retards, but I dare ask. Does Uva have a point? Could gamers themselves be to blame for the current state of video game movies? Do we even know what we want in a video game movie? Are we the more likely suspect? Let's explore this. Think about your favorite video game that you would like to become a movie. Now think of the actor that portrayed the main character. Think about the story, the setting, and the pacing of the game and how it could translate to film. Now think about what might be left out from your favorite game in a feature length film that you would be okay with. Now rinse and repeat those previous statements to a legion of rabid video game fans and I guarantee you will receive a compendium of vastly different answers. The gaming world endures due to the differences we as gamers share and the differing reasons for our love for certain games. How can we possibly produce that energy into a consensus on a video game movie? But come on TGA you say, it can't be that hard to reach that consensus. Okay then, let's test it out. Take a movie like Resident Evil. I firmly believe this falls into the category of Giant Step Forward that I mentioned earlier, but I also know multitudes of gamers who will fight me tooth and nail to exclaim their disdain for this adaptation. It didn't have the characters we love. Mila Jovovich sucks and can't act and was just there to appear nearly nude. The liquor's only in it for a minute, mutates into a tyrant. That's not supposed to happen, blah, blah, blah. Every kind of adaptation you can think of often suffers from the vision of a Hollywood producer. Dramatic license can make an adaptation soar into the annals of history, or crash and burn after liftoff. And it's more appropriate for a video game adaptation to have a few things shuffled around. Take the rumored movie version of Mass Effect. Good god I love this game. And I stake my claim that the sequel, Mass Effect 2, is the Empire Strikes Back of video games. But what makes this game so memorable and so epic is its length. There is just so much to do in the universe that Bioware created. And there's so many variations of the character, facial features, skin tone, even gender. So many roles to play, soldier, engineer, adept, infiltrator, sentinel, and vanguard. So how in the world could they possibly create a movie that would please every single fan of the game? There will be fans who will be royally pissed by the casting, the story elements, or whatever. But if every element of Mass Effect was put into a movie, side quests, dialogue, character arcs, you would have a movie series spread out over 40 hours in length. And that's just for the first game. This movie possibility alone is a prime example of the overall fan response to video game movies. They turn the process into a complex formula. I believe this to be a very good visual representation of the formula I was just talking about. Now bear with me for just a minute. Most gamers want a video game adaptation to have a good story. That is a crucial plus. It has to have strict adherence to the original game. Absolutely no straying and no introduction of the Uva Ball equation. And it has to have good action and immersion. It captures the original game's greatness but it can't be too overdone and absolutely not too cheap either. Okay. Characters! Characters have to be relatable, fleshed out, possibly with a well-known actor, but not too known and not too unknown. Okay, how about the overall film? Has to be big, has to appeal to masses and masses of people, moviegoers and video gamers alike, but it can't be too big or too small for that matter. I guess it is really complicated. And then you have to factor in all the things that run counter to this, or reciprocal in formula talk, and then you come up with something like... Um... Uh... Oh God, this will never work! <sighs> Let's just face it. There will never, never, never be a good video game movie. Never, never...
What the? That's it. That's it. Animated video game movies are some of the best done. Pokemon had an animated video game movie. Pokemon is the best video game movie. Oh my god! Pokemon is the best video game movie! <laughs> no! 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really letting my subjective opinion creep into this show, and I can sense some of you pulling away from me. Let me get back on track by stating that the Pokemon films are probably some of the best done video game movies. They stick with the original story of the games and keep the whole gotta catch em all attitude and saccharine sweetness of the games and its television series intact. In fact, this gives me a chance to explain the importance of this variety of video game movie, the animated production. Japanese anime movies are pretty popular on their own accord, but there have been consistent positive reviews of video game anime, such as the early Street Fighter animated features. But there's been a recent trend of major video game companies releasing a corresponding animated version of their latest releases added fan service for the game, with Halo Legends and Dante's Inferno and Animated Epic being especially good. And it's easy to see why these movies are so good. An animated movie adaptation of a game presents many opportunities to extend or lend more exposition to a story and its characters. Video games are already a form of animation, and thus the lead to an animated feature film really isn't that big. And you don't have to worry about those intangibles that gamers cling to with a live-action video game adaptation, like cast and setting. Although I guess you could say that voice actors could fill that void of uncertainty. Plus, many of these movies are a result of direct involvement of game developers, or game developers releasing it themselves. So all the action, drama, and quality character development can make an easy transition into a movie. The problems with this variety of video game movies are that there really isn't a whole lot of risk to take here. And if you consider video games as a form of art and you're looking to achieve a greater stake in that art, then animated movies might not be the best way to go. But that's a nitpick at best. The bigger problem is that these movies are primarily a directed DVD type of thing, limiting the cinematic buzz theatrical releases get and thus limiting the audience. But the quality of the films cannot be denied. And though the audience size for the next hopeful varieties of video game movies is equally as small, the quality is equally as great. The video game documentary and the fan-made movie. With much respect to the immersive movie, I'd have to say that these varieties of video game movies are by far the most successful. It may not be in a financial sense, but there are more important considerations. Documentaries like Chasing Ghosts and The King of Kong opened up a wider audience to the world of the video game player and how gaming has evolved in its 30 plus years of existence. There's no malice and no real bias to these films. Sure, there are those in the movies who fit the general gamer stereotypes that non-gamers have, but also showcase the place that video games have in the lives of these gamers, on what it means to play a game or to be beloved for playing that game. The documentary Second Skin also does an excellent job of this by shedding light on the lives of the typical MMORPG player and how the popular misconceptions of them are quite unfounded. I particularly love how these films achieve what no talking head on cable news can do, paint gamers as they really are. No more, no less. And as a result of this trait, these films have an almost universal appeal to gamers young and old. But if you really want to see how video game movies can be completely turned around, look no further than the fan-made movie. This is what I believe to be the final piece of the puzzle for the success of the video game movie. True Blue Gamers Making Movies. Whether it's tickling a nostalgic part of our brain or wowing us with the wonders of modern day special effects, these movies are definitely on par with any adaptation that Hollywood has wrought over the past 10 years. It's amazing how these filmmakers are able to capture the essence of the game while at the same time expanding on the story itself. Oftentimes they take shots at the game or even invert it upon itself where the game's structure is adapted to our world. Much acclaim has been given to fan films like the recent Mega Man film. The creator claims to have only spent $4,000 making it. Now imagine if a big time studio, be it a gaming studio, a movie studio, or a team up of the two, gave a fan like this the production value of a typical summer blockbuster. Imagine the possibilities, and imagine what the reputation of a video game adaptation would be then. So, what have we learned today? In any discussion about what makes something good or bad, it's all about the subjective opinion behind it. And while I clearly let my opinion overlap this show, I hope you take away the fact that the issue of a good video game movie is a complicated one. Formulas are not. Building a consensus on what makes a good video game movie is difficult, but it's not impossible. The best parallel that I can see is with comic book fans. They too suffer from the same problems that we're suffering from right now with our movie adaptations. They had to wonder if their lack of success was due to the passionate fans that couldn't take any changes to the characters and books that they loved. 
They had to wonder if the movie industry took their form of art seriously as a form of storytelling, or even as a form of art. We as gamers know from experience that not all games tell a story. I don't see a Tetris movie coming out anytime soon. But we do know for the games that do, they deserve a better movie to articulate that story. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Roger Ebert's comments on the nature of video games. Nevertheless, I remain convinced that, in principle, video games cannot be art. He has since walked back a little bit on those initial comments, saying how he didn't take into account all the experiences gamers have within the game, but he still doesn't see it as art. Yet. It's that kind of logic that makes the creation of a good video game movie all the more difficult. Especially if you have the premier film critic saying games can't be art. The video game movie is inevitable. The hardware has made video games cinematic in their presentation, and Hollywood's technological developments have made some ideas for video game movies possible. And in a sense, Hollywood's already gone gaming. Many games are actually employing big name actors to voice their characters or to be interactive models. And I guess the flip side to that is that most movie to video game adaptations are still bad, but that's another kettle of fish. But I think it's the multi-billion dollar video game industry that compels movie series to continue releasing video game movies. It's up to us as gamers to demand more from the filmmakers, but we also have to take a step back and make sure that we're not the ones killing the movie with our high ideals and immovable expectations. I hope that after you watch this, you ask yourself a question. What makes it so important for us to have a decent video game movie? For my money, it's because movies are the greatest form of entertainment there is. The universal ability to communicate so many emotions to so many people is a great way for gaming to increase its profile. We quote movies obsessively, have differing lists as to what we like and what we hate, and rant about them constantly. Movies are a form of entertainment that anyone can connect with, and we as gamers feel that gaming also has an equal ability to make connections. As this episode releases, there are currently two video game movies out. The direct adaptation Prince of Persia was by no means a stellar movie, but you know what? It was pretty good. It was a relatively faithful adaptation to one of the decade's best gaming series. Sure, I might be on the road to soul-crushing defeat with this adaptation, but I think Hollywood is starting a transition here. Having Jerry Bruckheimer at the helm of this definitely made it more appealing to the average moviegoer, and also to gamers. The other movie out right now is Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, which I guess would fit in the immersive variety of video game movies, and it's excellent on a level that's hard to define. The problem is that it looks like it's going to be the gamer's version of Annie Hall, or maybe the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Unfortunate, but still a step in the right direction. And the future shows us that there'll be plenty of more movies like this to come. Who's to say that none of these will finally break the streak and become a great video game movie? I myself don't have all the answers, but I do know a good video game movie's coming. We gotta have the patience that the comic book fans have, and then maybe one day when we hear that a new video game movie's coming out, we won't cringe. I'm the Gamer at the Paul, just bringing you closer to video game culture. Now if you'll excuse me, I have an electric rodent problem I need to fix.